All right. Well, a little catching up to do here. Uh, you know, where a previous passage, this all begins with uh, uh, Peter and, uh, and John, and there were about three in the afternoon, they're, they're going to the temple. Uh, Peter's always, already preached. 3,000 people have come to faith in Christ as their, uh, uh, you know, again, as uh, Jesus as their Messiah. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they're growing as a, as a body there uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, they go to the temple at the time of prayer, appropriate certainly for them, and an opportunity to share and teach and so forth in an area we call Solomon's Colonnade. Uh, they would have uh, passed through at some point in time uh, pass through the court of the women and then on to the court of, uh, of the men, the, the court of the Israelis. And we talked about the magnificent gate that was, uh, uh, that was there and so forth, its size and beauty. And outside that gate, even in our text called the beautiful gate, was a man that was lame. But he wasn't just lame, his feet were actually deformed. They were out of joint. And we made so everybody knew exactly this guy. Uh, every man that went to the temple walked by him, 40 years old, uh, passed by him on many occasions. We talked about the fact that Jesus would have passed by this guy many times. So it's very interesting that Jesus never reached out to heal this man, even though he would have had to pass by him on many occasions. Peter and John have walked by him on many occasions. But on one occasion, then God gave Peter the faith to believe uh, that this man could be healed. And of course, we kind of have that... Uh, Classic line, silver and gold have I, I none. I know many of us say that on a regular basis, but we don't follow it up with the other part. But what I do have, uh, I give you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He reaches out, grabs the guy, pulls him to his feet. He's uh, instantaneously uh, healed, uh, and uh, he's pretty excited about it. He's uh, doing a little jumping up and down. He's pretty excited, and he goes on into the temple, a place he could never go before uh, as a Jewish man because of his deformity. And he's able to go in and worship God. Peter takes that occasion to preach the gospel. Uh, and we're going to find out in our text that 2,000 more men uh, come to faith in Christ on that occasion. That leads then to them being arrested uh, in this persecution uh, beginning here in, uh, in the church. Uh, Jesus said this about believers in persecution in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Uh, if you were of the world, the world would, uh, the world would love its own. Uh, yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, world, uh, the word I said to you, a servant is not greater uh, than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute me, uh, you. Certainly makes sense. The uh, martyr uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer from his uh, Flossenburg cell in 1937 in, uh, in uh, incarcerated Nazi Germany wrote, uh, suffering is the badge of the true Christian. The disciple is not above his master. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ. And it is therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. And, uh, uh, and that's kind of what this passage is about in the response to the church in terms of prayer. Uh, but uh, we just want to make uh, the, uh, the obvious mention that uh, this text is, is so applicable to where we're at today, uh, here even in the United States, even here even in Hawaii. I had the opportunity to uh, talk with a gal that's a school teacher in the public schools here recently that uh, uh, had the occasion because of a question uh, being asked by her 14-year-old student uh, and uh, had the opportunity after class to lead him to faith in Christ. And she was very nervous and now very concerned. What would happen to her? Would there be repercussions? Would anything be said to her? What would happen? She was trying to find a church and get them plugged in and so forth. But those are the, uh, those are the days that, uh, uh, that uh, we live in. Uh, there's been uh, 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 tremendous pressure on... Um, uh, I know on the military for uh, guys and gals not to share their faith. And, there, and there's uh, been some things uh, come, come down uh, recently from the Department of Defense, from the Pentagon itself, uh, to say that uh, if you're hearing this from rogue uh, COs, you're, you're hearing the wrong message. We want people to be able to express, not just have their faith, but express it in the military. Uh, it was a huge thing. This came out about two weeks ago. Uh, General Boykin was uh, involved in meeting uh, on behalf of FRC with the uh, uh, some leaders there at the Pentagon, and we're thankful for that. And of course, his concern, our concern, is that now will it get implemented and get it out? Because it's, um, it's just different times that we're living in. And the reason that they are being persecuted, Peter and John, is because of the message of Jesus, because they're saying that he is the only way. 
He is the only way a person can get saved. Uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is the message that gets us in trouble as well. As long as we're willing to compromise that message and say there are many ways, it's not just the name of Jesus, uh, we're not, <clears throat> we don't find ourselves getting uh, uh, in near the trouble with authorities. It's when we make the exclusive claims of Christ that, well, people just don't, uh, don't like that. One thing I don't understand about the atheist who doesn't believe in God, why is he so mad at God, this God that he doesn't believe in? And why, and why is he or she so mad at the people that do believe in God? Why are you, why are you great believe in God? I don't believe in God. But unfortunately, uh, we, we have the new atheists that write now books and everything and New York, New York bestsellers coming trying to tear a, a person's uh, faith apart simply because they believe in something. I don't believe in it, and I don't want you to believe in it either. It's just... Uh, uh, and, uh, and if you don't agree with me, then you're the one that's intolerant. It's uh, very, uh, very interesting, the times that we live in. All that to say that uh, uh, our response should be in prayer as well. Uh, and we're going to look at that at the end of our text, but this is so applicable for us. Uh, one writer said, prayer is not, an escape, uh, uh, is not an escape from responsibility. It's a response to God's ability. And we want to be able to respond to him. Uh, biblically and appropriately, no matter what the circumstances we find ourselves in. Well, let's look at Peter and John. They're examined by the, uh, uh, the, uh, the authorities. And uh, just to say one other thing in terms of introduction, we're going to get introduced into uh, a group of men known as the Sadducees. And, uh, uh, and we kind of make a little distinction here because in the Gospels, uh, most of the persecution came from the Pharisees. In the book of Acts, most of the persecution, official Jewish persecution, comes from the Sadducees. <laughs> Uh, the Sadducees, uh, uh, you know, uh, a different sect than the Pharisees. They only believed in the first five books of Moses and uh, nothing else. Didn't think anything else was uh, inspired or anything. Uh, they uh, didn't believe in an afterlife. No heaven, no hell. You just live this life, this good moral life. Keep the law of Moses. You'll have a better life and so forth. Uh, they denied the existence of angels. They denied miracles. And, of course, uh, denied the, the resurrection. So you can see why they're a little bit upset with this message about Jesus that's, uh, that's being uh, preached here. And they are the power brokers. They are in charge. The whole family of Annas that we'll, uh, we'll see in our text, uh, they are the ones that control the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the day. Uh, they are the power brokers, the ones in the control. We would call them secular humanists today. And, uh, and certainly, again, uh, there's the application for us. There's just those uh, that uh, hold that view, an atheistic view uh, of God that uh, want to be able to impose that on anyone else and silence anyone that will, well, like these guys that speak in the name of Jesus. So very applicable. Well, let's look at the first seven verses as they get examined by the authorities. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and priests in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, uh, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem, uh, and when they had set them in the midst of them, by what power, they asked, by what power, by what name uh, have you done this? So they are examined uh, because of their message. Uh, notice uh, that, uh, again, that it's the Sadducees that are doing this. Verse 2, being greatly disturbed. This means they're ticked off. This is super uh, angry because to preach this message of the resurrection was like a declaration of war uh, against these guys. When it says they brought them in their midst, uh, uh, it, it's actually the, the setting. The high priest would sit uh, basically on a kind of a little mini throne right in the middle. Uh, all the Pharisees and the Sadducees would be uh, around them standing in, uh, uh, in circles uh, going out. Uh, and then they would actually be brought in the midst uh, of all of them in the same way that Jesus was brought uh, in their midst and, uh, and tried before the same group of people uh, only weeks before. Again, we mentioned uh, Annas. Annas was the real power behind everything. Uh, Annas had been the high priest at one time. Uh, then another Roman procurator, the guy before uh, Pontius Pilate took over, kind of dethroned him uh, and put his son-in-law, Caiaphas, in place. Altogether, he had five sons that were all high priests at one time, even though he 
He's the old man, even though he's been, in a sense, uh, uh, taken out of that position. He's still the guy that's actually in charge. And we see that in the night that Jesus was, uh, uh, was tried because the first place they took him was the house of Annas. Uh, and if you were going on a trip today uh, in Jerusalem, you could actually go and visit the archaeological sites uh, of these men's homes, except they're not homes, they're palaces. They were wealthy uh, and they were powerful uh, and they were threatened by Jesus Christ. Uh, along with the Pharisees, of course, uh, they, uh, they tried Jesus as a heretic uh, and then sought to and were successful in having the Romans uh, execute him. Uh, and now Peter and John find themselves before the same group of people. Uh, secondly, it's not just the message, it's the name of Jesus uh, that they're concerned about. As they ask actually an appropriate question, by what power or by what name uh, have you done this? Uh, and, uh, and actually that's what they were supposed to be doing. Something's going on of a miraculous nature. Uh, somebody is teaching something that uh, uh, was possibly in disagreement with the scriptures. They were to be brought before this council and this was a legitimate question. Uh, the answer could have been, should have been, uh, if Peter and John want to get out a jail card, all they've got to do is say, in, in response to this, in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because that's the way Jewish exorcists, uh, that's the way Jewish healers healed in the name of the patriarchs. They also could say in the name of Solomon, that was used as well. But of course, they know what, Je what these guys are going to say. They're going to say in the name of Jesus. And they're hoping that they will, because they've already tried Jesus, found him guilty, uh, of, uh, uh, and, and labeled him as a heretic. So if you're healing in his name, then you're guilty as well. Therefore, you'll suffer the same fate uh, as Jesus. And don't you think that Peter and John know this, uh, which uh, makes it uh, a little more dramatic in terms of Peter's response that we'll, we'll look at uh, in, in a moment. It's the name of Jesus, uh, and the reason that they're uh, being tried is because of what they're saying in his name. So the accusation, the accusation against these two believers to try to try them in this court uh, so they can uh, bring punishment upon them. Uh, and again, that's a, a very relevant thing in our, in our own country uh, where we have Christian men and women uh, with false accusations brought against them, sometimes in the press, sometimes actual, actual legal indictments brought against them. And we saw one this last week when Denise D'Souza, was a very fine apologist. We have some of his books in, in the bookstore. I've heard him speak on a couple of occasions. Very brilliant guy. Uh, and uh, he is arrested because of, uh, uh, he's indicted on uh, charges saying that he illegally uh, gave uh, camping contributions to a Senate race uh, back, uh, back on the East Coast. And, um, you know, you know I, don't, I don't know if he did it or not, uh, but my assumption is he didn't. Uh, he's also the producer of uh, Obama 2016, which is the documentary that uh, basically takes you through the childhood of, uh, of the president uh, growing up in Indonesia, uh, talking with his mentors and, and so forth. So you can try to understand his worldview, uh, and that's a very different worldview than any president that we've uh, had uh, before in the United States history. Uh, so, uh, you know, so he's not... Uh, He's not the darling of the, <laughs> of the Democratic Party uh, or the powers to be right now uh, and seems to be singled out uh, as uh, other groups have been uh, for prosecution because of their political views. Again, I don't know that he did it or didn't do it. All I know is that I would never assume that he did simply because he was charged with it. And, uh, but this is the, the days that we live in. Uh, Christian men and women are have uh, accusations brought against them. Uh, you, can, uh, you can go to websites uh, who, uh, it's, it's their whole ministry in life, their whole thing in life is to, uh, is to try to bring accusations against Christians and their wrongdoing, their wrong teaching, their wrong this and everything of some very good and godly men. Uh, it's the days that we're living in. It's something that uh, Peter and John are facing here. But notice the results of, uh, of Peter's sermon. Verse 4, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So two more thousand are uh, added. Again, this is in the court of the men. Not any gals there. It was the guys that were gathered around. So we got 5,000 men. We don't know how many women at this point uh, that are already part of this very early church. So Peter and John are examined by the authorities. It was because they gave a message about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
uh, they gave an, a, an exclusive message that said that Jesus, uh, there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we sometimes are saved. No, whereby we must be saved. It's the only way. Of, it's an exclusive claim. Uh, and, uh, and that's a problem, of course, in our culture today. Today in uh, academic circles as well as in our public schools, uh, we say the kids are learning the ABCs, anything but Christ. Uh, you can you can take the book of uh, you can take a Quran. In fact, in Southern California, you can go to many public school uh, uh, offices there on campus and ask for a copy of the Quran. And it'll be given to you. For example, I mean, you can te you can teach transcendental meditation. You can teach uh, but Buddhism about anything you want. Uh, just don't teach anything about Christ and His exclusive claims. These are uh, the issue here. It's the days that we're living in now. Well, listen. Uh, we'll see Peter's, uh, what we're seeing is an excellent response, and we'll give you several reasons why uh, we believe it's excellent. Verse 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he, uh, he has been made well, uh, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So uh, Peter's just getting warmed up here. But you know, just keep, keep in mind that uh, he, in saying these things and giving this defense that he's giving and this response, he, he very well could be the next guy on a Roman cross. And uh, uh, he realizes that, you know, we know the rest of the story, you know, but, uh, but he doesn't. And in fact, he does end up on a Roman cross upside down outside the city of Rome. But God's not done with him yet. Uh, and suddenly... The, the big fisherman has been transformed. I mean, again, these are the same guys that argued over every meal who was going to sit next to Jesus in the place of honor, who was going to sit on his right or left when he came into his kingdom. Uh, this is the Peter that denied him three times because a slave girl questioned him <laughs> as to whether he was a follower of Jesus Christ. Now he's standing uh, before what would be the equivalent of the Supreme Court of the United States, and he's given a, a pretty good defense. Uh, and uh, we're seeing it's excellent because, well, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit power that had transformed him uh, and gave him this ability to speak. Uh, and secondly, uh, it was an excellent response because it did include the resurrection. Verse 10, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. And this, again, was a, a declaration of war against the Sadducees. I don't know what the Pharisees were doing because they believe in the resurrection. And, uh, and of course, we see, we'll see later in the, uh, in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul used this to advantage and keeps himself from being killed on the Temple Mount at one point, point in time by kind of rallying the Pharisees here uh, around him because they also believed in the resurrection. Uh, but the, the Sadducees are in charge. They're the secular humanists of the day. And, uh, and this was a uh, war against them. Thirdly, it was excellent and courageous as well because his answer was based on prophecy. Again, he's speaking to a Jewish crowd, so he's quoting scripture. Verse 11, he quotes Psalm 18. This is the stone which was rejected by you, builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So uh, he uh, quotes this passage. It's a messianic psalm. Uh, it's uh, uh, referred to Jesus, uh, the same, uh, the same uh, passage when he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, on the week, the, the Sunday prior to his crucifixion, uh, what we call Palm Sunday. Uh, they knew the concept of the rock it was a representation of God. Uh, it was a symbol of God in Deuteronomy, in 2 Samuel, in Psalm 18, Isaiah 28. The prophet Daniel, in interpreting a dream, used a symbol of a rock and interpreted it uh, to be God himself. So he's making it very clear. He's saying that what you're doing and what you have done in terms of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, again, Psalm 18 says that, uh, that God would come, that uh, the Messiah would come, and yet you, you builders, would reject the chief cornerstone, that rock that would become. It's a little hard for us to understand this concept of chief cornerstone because in, uh, in, mid, in the mid 18, uh, 19th century, mid 1800s, uh, the idea of a cornerstone kind of changed architecturally here in the United States. 
and it became uh, this rock that was placed and the whole building was done it looked great and everything somewhere up in the pinnacle facing uh, commercial building facing the main street there would be a stone that would be placed there the capstone the cornerstone that maybe gave the name of the building the date that it was built and so forth and it was the last stone to go in and sometimes we we think of that when we read this idea of chief cornerstone but not in the ancient world not in the first century the cornerstone was the first stone that was brought in they're going to build a, a big building they can't even start until this cornerstone uh, it's a, it's a large stone and it has an exact 90 degree angle cut in it and they're going to lay that out and position it and then they're going to start pulling lines and doing measurements and the whole foundation is going to be measured and laid uh, based on the chief cornerstone. So the illustration, the application is there is a stone. God is coming. He's the Messiah, and everything will be based upon him. Nothing else can be built or will be built that will ever last unless it uh, comes from him, and he is, Peter says, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but prophetically, you rejected him. You sent him to be crucified. And... Uh, uh, again, it's just kind of, kind of amazing, Peter, at this point, and the boldness that, uh, that he has in this court hearing uh, before the Sadducees of all people. Uh, now, Jesus, uh, excuse me, Paul uh, mentions this uh, application as well in Romans 9.30, uh, quoting scripture as well from the Old Testament of who Jesus was being the chief cornerstone. There he says, what shall we say then that Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness even the righteousness of faith. It's, it's by faith and faith alone that we're saved. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Paul there, again, quoting scripture from the Old Testament, likens Jesus to a stone. In this case, he's saying that Gentiles, non-Jews, uh, many of them have come to faith in Christ by faith alone. They're not saved by righteous works, by keeping the Mosaic law, it's by faith. And here the Jewish people themselves that had the law when their Messiah came did not place their faith in him. He's like a stone that's placed in front of them and they tripped and stumbled over him rather than seeing him for who he really is. That's Paul's point uh, in a way. That's Peter's point here as well. But we know it is use of scripture and the inclusion of the prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. We'd say also it's an excellent response because it included the hope of salvation. Notice verse 12, uh, there is salvation, nor there is there salvation in any other, uh, for there is no other name under heaven given among men when, by which we must be saved. Again, this is the exclusive truth claim of Christianity, as Jesus said, uh, in John's gospel, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father uh, but, uh, but by me. As uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote, uh, G you know, Jesus says these things in such a way uh, to make it inescapable in terms of uh, who he is. Uh, and of course, that upsets a, a lot of people. The idea that uh, you Christians, you're so intolerant, you're intolerant of, uh, of other views. No, actually, we are tolerant. I, I, don't, I don't mind hearing what the, the guy that's the Buddhist that has to say, and, uh, and I don't even mind uh, shopping with him at the grocery store, and I don't even mind if he stands on the street corner and passes out some tracts of other people are interested in being Buddhist. I'm not really, I don't really mind. I think he should have a right and the freedom of this country to, to do that. Uh, it's just that when, when I want to do it, now all oh, you know what breaks out, you know, because uh, we're back to this Jesus and this exclusive claim uh, I, idea. I like what Barnold, uh, Donald Barnhouse, great preacher of a generation ago, said. He said, Jesus is the most intolerant person in the whole world, but he has a right to be. He set the standards. Uh, it was his world, uh, and it is his heaven, and he formed the insurance requirements uh, for uh, his heaven. There's only one way. I'm a pretty simple-minded guy, so I appreciated that. I'm glad Jesus didn't say, there are many ways you must find them. What does that mean exactly? You know, well, how do we know which one? You know, well, you'll have to find him. You'll have to seek out. You have to be a seeker. No, he says, I'm it. This is it. There's not another way. Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate that. You know, just, just tell me. Just tell me so I, uh, I can know. 
<laughs> but uh, you know, it'd be the same thing if uh, I got in my car after church and drove over to the Marine base and I, I tried to uh, get, get in the front gate. They could, get, they could say, uh, can I see your ID, please? And I said, yeah, I got, I got it right here. This is my military ID. It says, proud Air Force dad. That's it. That's, the best, that's my best shot getting in here. Because they wouldn't let me in. And I'd say, well, you're very intolerant. <laughs> I've never met such a bunch of intolerant people in my whole life. No, sorry, sir, you can't come on the base. Jesus, Jesus makes these truth claims. But then he, because he has provided the way through which our sins could be forgiven. Uh, he is the one that's been resurrected from, uh, from the dead. Uh, it's, uh, it's these claims that got them in trouble. Uh, it's the same truth claims that get us in trouble today and lead to uh, persecution. So uh, they uh, are examined by the authorities, uh, much like we are today. Uh, but uh, he gives an excellent response. Not bad for the, the big fishermen uh, that uh, they were going to say had no education. They're kind of marveled about uh, all of this, don't really know what to say to these guys. First time he preaches, 3,000 people get saved. Second time, 2,000 gets, uh, get saved. And now he's before the Supreme Court of the day. And, man, he sounds like a pretty good attorney. And he... <laughs> Again, courageous, realizing that this could cost him his life. Well, he's not done. Let's listen to him exhort this council on the meaning of true authority. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside, out of the council, council they conferred among themselves, saying... What shall we do with these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We can't deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had uh, further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing has been performed. So uh, the authorities, uh, I say, make uh, 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 some false assumptions about them. And, and uh, there's three that I'm going to give you from verse 13. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. They saw, again, uh, some translations, uh, the courage of Peter and John. It was all very perplexing to them. Uh, they, they, uh, they noted a, a note of miracle has, has been done. It's evident to everybody. We can't deny it. So they've got a, they've got a real problem on their hands. Uh, they've got now uh, 5,000 men in Jerusalem that are uh, citizens of that city that believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. They have uh, dozens and dozens of uh, these men that have now stand up to them with transformed lives. And they're in the temple and sharing their new faith in Jesus uh, as, uh, as the Messiah. And now this tremendous miracle has been done because everybody, that's the point of the gate. Everybody knew this guy. He's 40 years old. Uh, his feet are deformed in his ankles. And man, he's running around, jumping around. It's just, just, they don't even know what to say. And they're like, man, let's just threaten them. Maybe that's, that's the best thing we do. But they're perplexed. They can't get over these guys. But what I'm saying are three false assumptions. One is they're saying that they're, uh, they're uneducated. And that was not true. Their teacher was Jesus. I'm just kind of betting that maybe he was a pretty good teacher. What do you think? And uh, they were with him for three years. Uh, these are a bunch of guys that nobody would teach. Uh, again, you know, all, all Jewish young men, boys, they all went through, uh, went through school and got an education, a religious education, uh, and so forth. And there's a point in time when, you know, they get to be 13, 14 years old, it's time to go to work. Uh, and uh, these guys, unless, unless you're a really bright guy. Uh, you seem to really grasp all the theology and you have a tremendous memory and uh, uh, you can remember all of the uh, oral traditions and arguments for all the laws and so forth. And th then a rabbi might say to you, come, follow me. It was an official call by a rabbi. But uh, there's nobody calling Peter, James, and John, I can tell you that. They're going to fishing. They're going to follow their father in the fishing business. Uh, and, uh, uh, but Jesus comes to them one day and says, come follow me. That had to be a shocking thing. Me, be your disciple? Uh, and yet that's exactly what happened. And he taught them, and they had an education. 
They had no funny initials at the end of their name. And they never got a certificate from uh, the best school uh, in Jerusalem and so forth. But uh, these, these men are wrong to assume that the apostles had, had, uh, had no education. Uh, us Calvary Chapel guys can kind of appreciate this. And we're kind of into a new generation where, uh, where um, we, you know, we've got the Bible colleges going. And, uh, you know, some of us have gone back to school and so forth and uh, appreciate whatever education we can get. But... But uh, the, the initial church plants that went on were, were guys that, in a sense, fit this definition. And we were actually uh, uh, criticized. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd be going to school, and I'd be, I'd be uh, sitting uh, in seminars where uh, some guy would, up there would be talking about the, uh, the foolish idea that men could go out in the ministry without a formal education. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you know, throw a little comment in there that I was one of those guys, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, but that, but that wasn't wrong. I mean, I mean, that was wrong because I mean, you no, know, for me, I, I sat and listened to Pastor Bill teach through the word twice a week. I listened to, uh, you know, K-Light Radio and Chuck and Jay Verna for hour after hour after hour all day long, uh, every day, 10 hours a day, usually sometimes, sometimes 12, uh, uh, no, no formal education, but that's not to say that we didn't know the scriptures. Uh, but anyway, that, that's these guys. It's a false assumption. Uneducation. They had an education. They assumed that they were untrained. <laughs> I think G- Jesus probably did a pretty good job training these guys. All right, man, you're going out. I'm going to send you out in two. Yeah, don't take an extra cloak and don't take that. And said, by the way, I'm going to give you the power to, to uh, uh, heal, to cast out demons. Tell people the kingdom of God is in hand. Go. Do it. Just like I've been training you, go, and they'd come back, and they're all excited about that, you remember? And he said, don't get too excited about that. Just rejoice that your names are written in heaven. There's a lot of training training uh, going on. They lived with him, you know, day, day and night. Uh, that's a false assumption. The third one uh, I really appreciate because they said uh, that Jesus had been with them. Well, Jesus was still with them. Jesus said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. That was, that was the worst false assumption right there, that somehow Jesus was, wasn't even in the picture anymore. Uh, that uh, he had been past tense. No, he's present tense. He's future tense. Uh, he's never going to leave us. Never going to forsake us. And uh, and we don't need we don't need the formal education per se to uh, to serve the Lord to be used by God. We do need to know what the Bible says and be able to explain it to uh, to other people. We certainly we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but uh, uh, later in Acts, these same guys uh, they're not going to just get threatened. They're actually going to get beaten. And when they leave in chapter 5, verse 41, it says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for for the name. This is a strange group of guys here. Uh, Their lives have been totally, totally transformed. Uh, And there's evidence mounting against this court that they are wrong. Uh, And uh, and they're seeing it in in the testimony, the response of of Peter here. Secondly, uh, is uh, that idea, the facts were going against the authorities Again, if they want to disprove the resurrection, they don't like hearing about the resurrection, all they've got to do is produce the body. I mean, Jesus was buried right there in Jerusalem. Just go over and get the body. Uh, But obviously they couldn't do that. Uh, They didn't know what to say about the changed lives of Peter and John. And in the context of the miracle that had taken place in the name of Jesus, uh, they've got problems. And now Peter seems to have this new ability to draw from Old Testament scriptures and make them exactly applicable to the lives and the people that he's, uh, he's standing before. Again, this court and Satan uh, has been trying to silence God's people from the very beginning. That's what they want, right? Just don't say Jesus anymore. Just stop talking about the resurrection and we'll all get along. Pretty, pretty relevant passage of scripture here. Uh, and, um, and of course, uh, verse 18, they're, they're not going to do that. And so uh, I've got four principles that are to guide us uh, in regards to civil disobedience, because that's, uh, that's what they're talking about uh, in verse 19. They command them not to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus, verse 18. But, contrasting term, Peter and John answered, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge, for we cannot speak the things, we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. In Romans 13, Paul says, uh, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authorities that, that exist except that which God has established. Everybody's supposed to submit himself to governing authorities. They are supposed to submit themselves to the governing authorities, and they're standing before the highest authority in the land. So where do these guys get off? Well, 
uh, in the same way we should. Uh, they've got some reasons for why they're doing this. Uh, and uh, we need to have the same kind of reasons if for some reason in the future uh, we were ever to, uh, to not, uh, again, obey those in authorities. There are nurses that are Christians in this country that have been called from one part of a hospital uh, to another part of a hospital to assist with an abortion. And they've refused to do it even though that's their boss and it might cost them their job. That's civil disobedience. But there, there's, there's, a, there's some reasons and some thinking behind it. Does that mean I can get away with not paying my taxes anymore? Because, you know, that's a really corrupt government. I, well, it was a pretty corrupt government in the first century, too. You know, Rome wasn't the greatest guys to be, uh, to be, uh, to be living under either. So you, we got to be very, very careful with, uh, with this. So here's four. Uh, Peter's decision was based on what was morally right. It wasn't safe. It wasn't popular. But it was the moral high ground. Uh, to, uh, to continue to be a witness for, uh, for Jesus Christ. And if we make some decision to not obey somebody in authority over us, especially in the government, man, we better have the moral high ground to be able to make that uh, decision. And secondly, uh, they had the clear teaching of God's word uh, on their side. That's the whole point. Stop being a witness of this guy. Well, Jesus said in one, uh, Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. They, they were following exactly what Jesus had, uh, had asked, them, uh, asked them to do. Uh, so anytime that uh, we find ourselves in a situation of, quote, civil disobedience, <laughs> we better have a chapter and verse uh, to support uh, what, what we're doing. Uh, of course, we have uh, some uh, notable examples in the Old Testament. The Jewish midwives during the time in Egypt when they were told to basically kill all the male babies. And of course, they, they refused to do that. And they said, sorry, we just seemed like we're not quite getting there in time these, these, these days. Uh, Moses' parents disobeyed the civil authorities over them when they hid, hid Moses. Uh, Daniel refused to pray to a pagan god. And then later, he refused to miss a prayer meeting as he would uh, face Jerusalem uh, and, uh, and pray three times a day. Uh, as he did that, then he knew he would be thrown into a lion's den. He disobeyed the king's orders uh, in doing it. But they had, they had the moral high ground and they had a clear cut passage of scripture, a word from God that was uh, supporting and directing their actions. <laughs> Three, this is very important. Peter's conviction touched all of his lives. Uh, Peter was an apostle, he wasn't a perfect guy, but um, he was doing his best to, uh, to live for the Lord. In other words, he wasn't living a life of immor in, in, immor immorality and then on occasion somehow trying to choose some moral high ground for a decision that he was making when he wasn't going to submit to somebody. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's, it's like the person that uh, is so committed to the environment, they'll, they'll risk their own life in a little zodiac to get between a whaling ship and a whale to try to save, save, save the whale. You know, God bless them. Uh, the problem or the contradiction then comes in when they're quite willing to allow an unborn baby uh, to be killed. Not that they all hold that view, but I would say the majority do. Uh, there's a contradiction because this morality isn't all-encompassing uh, in their life. It's kind of a pick, pick what you want, choose what you want. Peter and John are not doing that, uh, and neither can we, neither should we. Uh, four, they acted with, courtes with courtesy and respect. Uh, Daniel uh, tried to avoid getting the guard in trouble when he wanted to alter his diet so he could remain kosher. Uh, Peter and John uh, used uh, uh, you know, this arrest as a witness for the resurrection. Uh, love is to always be uh, the motivation. And, uh, and of course, this is the kind of thing that we go through and talk about before we, uh, we go to China and smuggle Bibles into China. We are breaking the law when we uh, take a suitcase full of Bibles into China. You are not allowed. You can take yourself one Bible, you're allowed to do that. Anything beyond that, you're breaking the law. And we, we do it time and time again because of these principles and because of what Peter says here. We have the moral high ground. We, are, we have the scripture supporting what we're doing. Uh, and and we, we tell uh, whoever's going with us, and, uh, and uh, many times it's been, it's been the kids, uh, and we tell them, listen, you know, what, if you're asked, do you have Bibles in your suitcase, don't lie. You say, yes, I do. You, in fact, say, yes, sir, I do. Uh, be respectful. Uh, because if they're asking, they probably think you do. They're going to open your suitcase anyway and find them. 
Worst thing you can happen is say, oh, no, I don't. And then they open the suitcase and they go, I thought you said you were a Christian. You just lied to me. And they will say that, too. I have a, have a friend who's a pastor here in Hawaii that's had that experience. So, uh, so with respect, with, with morality, uh, but following the clear teaching of God's word. We need to be very careful. Every time we talk about that Romans 13 passage, you know, uh, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. It's always like, is there any exception to that? <laughs> Everybody wants to know the exception right off the bat. How about we just do that? You know, and then, yeah, there's going to be an exception from time to time in very extreme cases. Uh, and this is the support and the principles behind that kind of a decision. Well, let's get to the example uh, of this uh, very effective uh, prayer meeting here in verse 23. I am being let go. They went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God uh, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why do the nations rage? And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, your holy servant Jesus, whom you uh, anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Certainly one of the great prayers of the Bible and I love to study the prayers of the Bible so that I can learn to be more effective in, uh, in praying and certainly there's some important things that uh, uh, our, our prayers will be more effective if, if we do a couple of things that they, they did here. Uh, notice that their, their, uh, their prayer is born out of uh, witness and service. You know, they're not thinking, I'm praying about getting into the game. They're, they're in the game. Uh, there was an urgency to their prayer because there was a real enemy and there was a real danger. And I just want to tell you, we have a real enemy and we have real danger. And there, there should be an urgency uh, about, uh, about our prayer life. Secondly, uh, their prayer was based on the word of God. They used scripture uh, in, the, in this prayer. Uh, in verse 25, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why do the nations rage and so forth, quoting, uh, quoting the psalm. Uh, now this is going to get fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes back to earth. Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back, that's what the nations are going to, to do. They're going to come together against Christ uh, and prevent him from coming. Uh, and it will be a laugh uh, to, uh, to God in, uh, in heaven. But Peter knows that scripture and he says, uh, those guys, uh, the nations coming against us, that's like when Pontius Pilate, uh, when, uh, when Herod, uh, and when the, uh, the, uh, the Romans and the Israel, uh, the Jews that were in charge, uh, yeah, came against the Messiah. So he's, he's looking at scripture, he's able, able to bring it into his mind, incorporate it into his prayer, uh, and that's, that's important to be able to do. Uh, John says in, in one of his epistles uh, that... Um, if we pray according to his will, then we know he hears us. If we know that he hears us, we know that he's going to do what we're asking him to do. Uh, we certainly want to be praying in his will the best we can. Again, prayer is never designed to get my will be done, praise the Lord. It's designed to get God's will be done. And, uh, and sometimes I'm not even sure what to pray. Uh, you know, there's somebody that needs prayer for healing. I'm going to pray for healing. Is that God's will? I don't really know. So, I'm, you know, Lord, if it's your will, we just pray because I, I don't really know. Uh, but it'll sure help me a lot the more scripture I have. You mean I should be memorizing scripture so when I pray, God can bring it to my mind and I can play scriptural prayers? Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it helps us understand the heart and the mind of God. And when it can help shape and form our, uh, our prayers, it's, uh, uh, it's helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, and again, I just, you know, as, as we are praying before, you know, it's just John 14, you know. Uh, trust in God, trust also me and my father. So it just, you know, uh, here's a situation that scripture just, you know, comes to your mind, Lord, this is what you say, and this is what we believe. And, and now, you know, God doesn't need to be reminded of his word. We do. <laughs> we need to be reminded what he says and his promises and uh, how we can trust him and, and so forth. Uh, and they, they brought scripture into their prayers. So important. Three, 
uh, the church's prayer, and this is kind of, you're not going to like this. Uh, they did not pray for their circumstances to change. <laughs> my, I'm always praying for my circumstances to change. I'm all, you know, it's like, oh, Lord, if you just kind of move this guy over here and take care of that. And, you know, because, you know, God needs some help. You know, he needs, uh, I need to help direct things, you know, and he's probably busy at times. And I have the complete understanding of my circumstances. And, uh, you know, so it's good to help God out once in a while. Uh, but if I can stay at it long enough, of course, then, then I can kind of come around and bring scripture into it and realize that, uh, okay, that may not be exactly God's will. But uh, I'm being facetious here, but uh, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, these guys, it's like, okay, they might, they might be arrested again. They might get beaten again. They are. Uh, they might get crucified again. They will. Uh, but uh, they're never praying that God would spare them of any of those things. Uh, they're not even praying that... Uh, uh, you know, move that guy out and give us, a, you know, a better governor in here. Do this, do that. They're not praying for their circumstances to be changed. Rather, they're praying that they will be changed in the midst of their circumstances. And so often in prayer, I think that's what God's more interested in, uh, is uh, our own lives. I love what Philip uh, Brooks uh, wrote at one time. He says, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger, men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers Pray for powers equal to your task. Lord, that's too hard for me. I don't think I can do that. Give me something else to do. No, I'll just give you the strength to do the thing I'm asking you to do. Uh, you know, that's, uh, again, it's our temptation, I think, to pray that our circumstances would be changed. That, that's not what they did here. Four, the church's prayer was to a sovereign God. And of course, this is kind of how they begin the prayer, verse 24. Lord, you are God. Who made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Again, uh, they didn't pray this because they thought God forgot. <laughs> They're praying this for their, their sake, for their sake, that they'll remember. Uh, that, Lord, you, you made it all. There's nothing too hard for you. Uh, you know, Jeremiah says there's nothing that's impossible uh, for God. Uh, and sometimes we need to remind ourselves of, of God's sovereignty. They even make, make a remark to the fact that uh, Jesus dying on the cross was by by design and plan. These guys thought they knew what they were doing and they, they did this, but Lord, we know you set this whole thing up so that Jesus could die for our sins. And, uh, uh, and they, they come to the conclusion that that guy got healed so they could preach the gospel. Uh, they preached the gospel so that they could get arrested, so that they could make a defense and give an answer before the Sanhedrin. Uh, and what they want now is the ability to continue to do that, that they'd be praying for uh, for boldness. And I just find it fascinating that a guy like Peter needed to pray for boldness. <laughs> this is a guy that, uh, you know, has got the foot in the mouth disease very often. I'm not, I don't know that I think he just kind of need to, you know, dial it back. You think he'd be praying, Lord, help me dial it back a little bit, kind of keep my mouth shut here a little bit, you know. But he's not. He's like the new Peter, and he's, he's praying for boldness. The Apostle Paul uh, uh, very often, you know, would ask others to pray that I'll have the boldness to share when I, uh, when I, when I have the opportunity. Sometimes we, we find ourselves not having the boldness to share when we have the opportunity. And guess what? We're like Peter and Paul. You know, we don't think of them that way. Sometimes we need, we need to ask other people to pray for us as well. We need to ask the Lord to give us the ability, the boldness to pray. It's amazing. God was uh, sovereignly involved in, uh, in everything. Again, faith is not having the future laid out in front of us. Uh, faith is not knowing the future, but trusting God uh, anyway. And then, of course, the answer to the prayer in verse 21, when they had prayed, the place uh, where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. God answered that prayer. And just to make note of the fact that this will be the second time uh, we read of the apostles and others being filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, John 20, uh, Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. We'd say they were born again at that point. Uh, and then in Acts chapter uh, 2, the, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Here we're in Acts chapter 4 and they are filled with the Holy Spirit and it's not done yet. And we're like these guys, leaky vessels. You know, that's why so often we're, we're, we should be praying, God, fill me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Uh, because for the purpose of being a witness. Uh, for you. And, uh, and they're praying over and over again for the same thing, as we should as well. And when they do, God answers their prayer. The place is, uh, is shaken. And sometimes we need to pray that uh, our lives would be shaken. 
I don't know that I want the building shaking here. I'm not sure we could get the shopping center guys, uh, you know, who have a hard time getting them to fix a roof. You know, if half the building starts coming down, we could be in a tent somewhere. So let's just pray that our lives would be, uh, uh, would be shaken in, in the process. Amen. In you like the branch on the vine. Do you roll all the clouds from the sky? I'm alive in you like the wheat in the field Till the harvest takes me away And I want to hide in you like the wind in the sky Just like the wind in the sky Just like the wind in the sky Just like the wind in the sky. Just like the wind in the sky. Just like the wind in the sky. Your peace, like a flood, has filled the place inside my heart. You surround me with your love, and I know. can only bow under your mercy, under the wonder of your grace. I can see the lifting of my burden in your holy face. I will abide, my life will I can only bow under your mercy, under the wonder of your grace, and I can see forever when I look into your holy face, I will abide, my life will stand together.
to die. I won't be running scared. I won't be trying to hide. It's time to disappear. You can bury my body and throw my dust into the air. I'll be headed for the hills of glory. Blessed hope will rise and he will.